We hope you really enjoyed your day yesterday. We heard lots of great comments about the sessions you attended. Um, we hope that you've gained some information and had the opportunity to network with some other people while you're here and really take advantage um, of, the, of the time that you're here with, with other colleagues. So at this time, I would like to welcome Jim Walsh. We're very happy to have Jim here today. Um, he, Jim graduated from the University of Texas School of Law in 1975. In 1983, he was one of the three lawyers who founded the firm now known as Walsh Galagos Trevor, well, I'm not pronouncing that right, Kyle and Robinson. From the beginning, the focus of the firm was on serving public schools, helping the people who help the kids. In his career over 40 years, Jim has provided training to all the educational service centers in Texas, numerous statewide organizations, and hundreds of school districts. He's the principal author of the Educator's Guide to Texas School Law, which is used as a textbook in many higher education programs. He has also authored the Common Sense Guide to Special Education Law. He was the longtime author of the popular Law Dog column in the Texas School Administrator's Legal Digest and currently produces a daily digital blog. The Law Dog's Ed Daily and he has taught school law of Texas, at Texas State, Baylor, and St. Edwards Universities. Jim is a former member of the Board of Directors for the National Council of School Attorneys. In 2017, he was recognized by his peers in the school law section of the State Bar with the Kelly Lifetime Achievement Award. So we want to welcome Jim here today. Thank you, Jolly. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody ready for another day? I just, I just picked up a new term here, legal literacy. That's what we're working on. So very glad to have an opportunity to talk to you all today about that. A um, couple of thank yous. First of all, I want to thank Julie Weatherly. Uh, because when Julie and I got this assignment that we were going to do the year in review, of course, we had to split it up. And uh, so we talked on the phone, and she immediately said, I will take the COVID cases. And I said, oh, praise God. <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with the COVID cases. So I was grateful to Julie for that. And thanks to Jolly and the whole staff at the, at the Resource Center uh, for making everything so easy and uh, putting this conference together. Uh, this is the first uh, out-of-state conference I've done since, you know, the pandemic. It's my first time on an airplane, you know, all pretty exciting stuff. And uh, I want to particularly mention the, the unique swag gift that the presenters got. I don't know if anybody's told you about this, but, you know, when you're a presenter at these conferences, you always get something. And I've got a lot of thumb drives, keychains, coffee cups. But here, we got something much more personal. We got a sterilization kit, all right? <laughs> so all of the presenters are going home neutered. Just, just thought you ought to know that. So, you know, very thoughtful. It's uh, interesting. So thanks for that. So I got a lot to talk to you about. I've got a, how long is the handout? I think it's 54 pages, something like that. Yeah, 54 pages. We're not going to go through each and every one of those cases. I expect you all to stay up late tonight reading all of them. But uh, we're going to hit the highlights, and we're going to talk about uh, a, a number of issues. I just kind of put the issues in alphabetical order, and we'll take them up that way. So we'll, <clears throat> we'll go through the PowerPoint, and I will call attention to things that are in the handout, the cases that I particularly want to mention. So let's take a look at it. We're going to start with uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act in Section 504. Uh, and uh, I, I put them together because they're really the same law. The only difference is in the coverage. 504 applies to institutions that receive federal money, and ADA applies to pretty much everybody else. But they're the same thing. They both say that you can't discriminate against people on the basis of disability. Uh, and this is where we get terms like reasonable accommodation uh, and that type of thing. So we have a lot of cases. My handout has 20 cases, and there's been more than that, but these are just 20 that uh, that I noticed and I thought were worthy of talking about. So 20 cases, I think that's the largest single section in this handout. It's a big increase in litigation over this, 
And here's the themes. There's a lot, a lot of these cases are retaliation cases. There's a big rise in retaliation cases. So we're going to talk about how they work and uh, what you can do to avoid that type of thing. And then we're going to learn a little Latin, respondeat superior. I'll tell you how that fits into this. I want to talk about child find as it applies to 504 and its intersection with IDEA. I want to make sure everybody understands that it applies to extracurricular activities. It applies to everything the school does. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the word intentional discrimination. So let's talk about retaliation now. A retaliation case basically involves the plaintiff has to prove three things. Number one, I engaged in some sort of protected activity. And in many of these cases, that protected activity is advocating strongly for my child. Uh, perhaps I'm the parent that is a little bit of a uh, bother to the school district because I'm very demanding. Or I bring an advocate uh, or an attorney to the uh, case conference committee, that I'm, or maybe I file a complaint with the state agency, or maybe I request a due process hearing. Uh, and so I'm advocating on behalf of my child. That's protected activity, and what that means is there can be no retaliation for that. So they have to prove that they've engaged in protected activity. That's not too hard to prove. Second thing they have to prove is that they suffered some adverse action, that's the term. Now, a lot of these cases, a lot of retaliation cases are employment cases. And in that case, the adverse activity is I got fired, or I got non-renewed, I got a cut in pay, I got transferred to an assignment that they knew would, uh, would induce me to quit. Uh, so it's that type of thing. So, you know, I, I think of this kind of in baseball terms. If I have engaged in protected activity, I'm on first base. I've made it to first base. If I've suffered an adverse action, I'm on second base. It's not hard for the plaintiff to get to second base in a retaliation case. Most of the cases do that. The hard part is getting around third and scoring. Because in order to do that, you have to prove causation. You have to prove these things happened, but they're causally connected. They punished me because I, because I engaged in protected activity. So uh, the very first uh, case in here is a child abuse case. And I hate to start the day with a child abuse case, but it's a case where the school was accused, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the school made a report of suspected child abuse against the parent. And it was unsubstantiated. The investigators looked into it and said, we don't see evidence of child abuse here. So the parent's on second base. I've engaged in protected activity by advocating for my child. I suffered an adverse action. Getting a child abuse report is not a good day for you. Uh, and so she's on second base. Uh, she didn't win the case, uh, it, but, but please notice what it went through. The school district tried to get it dismissed. They failed. The court said, no, we think she may have something here. So we're going we're to let this case proceed. And it did. And when all the evidence came out, you can see from the quote, the court said that uh, there's no evidence here. There's no evidence that would support a finding that the district personnel harbored. I need to learn where I can lean. OK, it didn't happen that time. <laughs> uh, that they harbored ill will or any kind of ill intention toward the parent. No evidence of that. And so the case ends up in favor of the school district. But notice that it went to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. This was a lot of litigation. And you know, here's the main point I want to make about cases like this. You can't let fear of litigation prevent you or, or, or chill you from making a child abuse report when you need to make a child abuse report. That's something that needs to be done. You know, child abuse is one of the few areas where you can commit a crime based on what you did not do. You know, most of the time to commit a crime, you've got to do something. Child abuse is different. If, you, if, you, if, if you're seeing evidence of child abuse and you fail to report it, that's the crime. So, you know, don't let cases like this make you think, oh, well, we better be real careful about child abuse report. You should be careful, but you should report it when you have reason to suspect. And this case is, is fairly typical. The courts, the, the, the investigators, the child abuse uh, people said, no, there was not child abuse. Well, that doesn't mean that the report was made in bad faith. You know, we're responsible for making a report when we suspect that the student may have suffered abuse or neglect. So we need to do that. Jones versus Board of Education down here is a, is a case that illustrates the danger of uh, things that we might say irreverently or um, flippantly 
by email. This is another retaliation case. Uh, you can read the fact situation, it's kind of interesting. I want to call your attention to the comment that I put on page three here. Text messages between the principal and the cop referred to the dad as non-stable and a crazy. The cop asked the principal if he had been too harsh with the dad and the principal replied, not too harsh at all. You need to be aware of the fact that if there is litigation, frequently all of the email communication, text messages and so on is discovered in the proceedings and we don't want to drop our professional standards in the way we talk about people. Uh, so this is another case where this, the court, this is at an earlier stage and the court said we're not dismissing this, this could be a potential retaliation case. So, uh, so we're seeing a lot of that and, um, and we just want to be uh, kind of careful about that. So adverse report could be a child abuse report. So let's learn a little Latin. I want you, to say, I want you guys to say this on the count of three. It'll instantly make you feel smarter. You, you ready? The term is respondeat superior. One, two, three. Good, good for you. Don't you feel smarter? Haven't we just elevated the conversation this morning? Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out what that means. It basically, when I was in law school, they told me that what this means is let the boss pay for it. And it is, it is, a, is a standard hallmark of American tort law. Uh, personal injury lawyers are very familiar with this. And here's the most common illustration of this. <clears throat> if I'm at the grocery store, and there is a spill of water on aisle six, and maybe it's been there for 15 minutes, and somebody was supposed to have cleaned it up and they didn't, and I slip and fall and I hurt my back. I really don't want to sue the minimum wage guy with the mop bucket that was supposed to clean it up. I want to sue whoever owns the grocery store. Respondeat Superior lets me do that. So the basic notion of respondeat superior is we're going to let the employer be liable for the negligence of the employee. And so it's a common feature of, of American tort law. Uh, it's, it's not so common with school districts. It generally doesn't work. Common feature of our tort law, making the employer liable for the negligent acts of the employee. General rule is it does not apply to federal law and it does not apply to governmental entities like uh, school districts that have some sort of immunity. But there's some exceptions. ADA in 504 is an exception. And that's pretty important for us to know. Now, the best case to illustrate this is SC versus Round Rock. And I know that uh, Julie mentioned this case yesterday. I want to go into a little more detail with you. This is a uh, student who had a 504 plan due to an eating disorder. And when she was in middle school, according to the lawsuit, um, things went well. The school implemented the, the, the plan. And then she goes to high school, and there seemed to be a disconnect. The high school didn't seem to implement the plan as well. But the bigger problem was that the journalism teacher thought that the girl's personal story would be a great feature article in the yearbook. And so she approached the student to get her to, be, to agree to this and to have photographs and interviews. And she never, con according to the lawsuit, she never contacted the parents to get consent for any of these activities. <clears throat> and so, uh, I guess they did write this story in the yearbook and the girl had a lot of emotional suffering as a result of that. The parents ended up putting her in an out-of-state facility that specializes in eating disorders. She lost 43 pounds and we eventually get a lawsuit. <clears throat> now you'll notice in my material, this case is mentioned three times right in a row. It begins at the bottom of page three. Why is that? Well, the first case is there because this is the effort of the teacher to get, the, get herself dismissed from the case. So the teacher's lawyer files a motion to dismiss and the court grants it. Now, the only person in the school district that's really personally accused of wrongdoing here is the teacher. And yet the teacher is dismissed from the case. Why? Because 504 does not permit personal liability. So the court said, well, whatever else happened here, the teacher we don't have the, we can't make the teacher liable for this, so we're dismissing the teacher. So that's the first thing that happened. Now the second one, right down at the bottom of page three, is the school district's effort to get the case dismissed, what the lawyers call on the pleadings. In other words, this is, we ask the court to look at, look at what this case alleges, and even if everything they say is true, there's no basis for legal liability for the school district. The court said, no, there, there is a basis because of respondeat superior. This case is alleging wrongful action by a teacher, and under ADA and 504, that can be attributable to the school district. 
So we're not going to dismiss it on the pleadings. Okay, let's start taking depositions. Let's gather some evidence. Let's get some facts. So they did that. And the district makes another effort to get this case dismissed. And that's discussed over on the next page. That's at the top of page four. And it was the teacher's affidavit that the court relied on to keep the case alive again. Look at what the teacher's affidavit said. The teacher's affidavit says <clears throat> that she knew that the student had a 504 plan. Did you know this girl had a 504? Yes, I knew she had a 504 plan. Did you know that that plan uh, says she's to be excused from any discussion involving body image, diet, or related topic? Yes, I knew that. Knowing that, you had this conversation with the girl? Yes, I did. The court said, that's evidence of intentional discrimination, okay? So, uh, so the case is alive. I don't know what will happen. Uh, this is Round Rock ISD. It's not far from where I live. Our firm's not representing Round Rock. Interestingly, the plaintiff's lawyer used to be with our firm. <laughs> so he's now representing the parent in this case. So, so responding on Superior. So you need to, you know, my message to you about this is please be sure that everybody in your school district is taking a 504 plan as seriously as we take IEPs. I think teachers are taking IEPs seriously. I can remember when they didn't. I can remember when that was the big issue. And, and me and Julie and other lawyers, we got called into a lot of school districts to try to put the fear of the law in the teachers. You know, really make sure they understood how important it is that they implement that IEP faithfully. We need to do the same thing with 504 because uh, my impression is uh, it's not always getting across. And we're, we're now in what I call the second generation of 504 cases. The first generation of 504 cases were simply about access to the school, access to the basketball team, facilities, ramps, you know, wide spaces to the, to the bathroom, parking places. That's the first generation. The second generation are cases like this which is, you know, they had a 504 plan, they didn't implement it. And so uh, responding at Superior is a, is, a, is a good piece of uh, information for you to have. And later in the materials, it comes later, I'm not gonna call attention to it particularly, but Doe versus Alameda County says that responding at Superior applies when the person is not an employee, but an independent contractor. So some of you hire people, particularly to do related services, they're not employees of the school, they're independent contractors. The Alameda County case says the school district can be liable for the wrongful actions of an independent contractor as well. So we certainly want to be careful about that. I'll also tell you there's a whole lot of cases in here by the Doe family. They are the most litigious family in America. You might want to just keep an eye out for that. And if the Doe family's moved into your school district, my suggestion is take those people out to dinner, see what they want, give it to them. So, <clears throat> 504 child find and IDEA. So, uh, that's the next issue here. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the development of a, of a 504 plan. Do we, have, do we have 504 coordinators here, by the way? Anybody here? You are? I can see you. Everybody raise your hand high. I like to check on your health. Are you feeling okay this morning? <laughs> the reason I do that is I was doing a 504 presentation in a school district one time when I found out that the 504 guy had died. And uh, you know, I was, they had a handbook, they had their own handbook on 504. And, and it named the coordinator. And so I'm rolling along, I'm doing my presentation, and I get to the part about the coordinator. I said, now your coordinator is, uh, and I look down, and said, George Rodriguez is your coordinator. Well, as soon as I said this guy's name, everybody's nudging people and they're kind of grinning. And I said, what's the deal? <clears throat> Well, George isn't with us anymore. Oh, he, he retired? No, he, no, he, uh, he died. Oh, well, how long ago was that? About three years. He dead, dead about three years. I said, well, your book here says he's the, yeah, we know, but, but he's dead. <laughs> no, you know, I just kind of went on with the presentation. What do you do? And, you know, and superintendent came by after the presentation. She said, how did it go? I said, it went well, but, you know, I learned something I think you ought to know. She said, what's that? I said, did you know you got a dead man for a 504 coordinator? She said, yes, that's part of our strategic plan. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yeah, that way when those angry parents call, we say, I'm sorry, he can't come to the phone. I said, well, that's not gonna work for very long. She said, I won't be in this district much longer. So this is strategic thinking at the highest. So 
So uh, 504 coordinators, I want you to think a little bit about child find in particular with regard to, uh, to, to uh, 504 and how it interacts with IDEA. So uh, let's take a look at DC versus Klein in connection with that. And let's see, I kind of lost my page. Where is this? Somebody yell it out if you see it. Oh, it's at the bottom of page four and it goes on to page five. This case recently decided went to the Fifth Circuit. And what I found particularly interesting about this case is the school district in third grade identifies the student under Section 504 and puts the student into a 504 program of some sort, starts providing accommodations and services pursuant to 504. In fourth grade, they continue. They have another new 504 plan. Why is this student in 504? The student has a problem with reading. Now there was a lot of talk in this case about whether or not it was dyslexia, but whether it was dyslexia or not, it was reading. There was, everybody agreed to that. That was what the student's issue was. I want you to think a little bit about putting the student in 504 due to a problem with reading. Let's think about what it takes to go into uh, 504. Here's the criteria. There's three things to be eligible under Section 504. You have to have a physical or a mental impairment. It has to be a pretty major problem. It's not a minor irritation. It's a substantial limitation on your ability to perform a major life activity. And uh, so it's three, three factors, physical or mental impairment, a substantial limitation of a major life activity. And I think in a lot of uh, 504 forms, we have the check boxes in that order. I think a lot of times 504 teams consider it in that order. I'm gonna to suggest to you, you flip it upside down and you take up the major life activity first. And this DC Klein case is an excellent example of that. What was the major life activity they were worried about? Reading, what's reading connected to? Learning, thinking, concentrating. Don't we have another law that addresses those issues more specifically? Why are we not offering an IDEA evaluation to a student whose major life activity that is substantially limited by an impairment is reading or learning? I wouldn't mess with 504. Some people say, well, the parents want 504. Okay, let's be sure that they understand that we have another program. And by the way, IDEA is a better program. It's a better program for the student. It provides a more robust standard for FAPE. It's a better program for the parent. It provides better procedural protection. It's a better program for the school. They get some money for serving a student under IDEA. They don't get that under 504. So why are we not doing that? So my suggestion to 504 teams is start with the major life activity. And that's usually pretty easy to identify. I mean, that's why we're talking about the student in the first place. In that Round Rock case, the student's major life activity was eating. That's a major life activity. I do it every day, don't you? Uh, some kids have asthma. The major life activity is breathing. I've got that at the top of my list of major life activities. Um, sleeping can be a major life activity that is substantially limited by a sleeping disorder. Walking, we have students that are in a wheelchair. Uh, a hearing impairment is certainly a major, uh, uh, an impairment that affects a major life activity. Uh, it doesn't necessarily require special education. Uh, so I think we ought to start with what's the major life activity. And I would suggest to you that if the major life activity is learning or any of its first cousins, reading, thinking, concentrating, Let's be sure we're offering the parent an evaluation under IDEA because that is the specific federal program that deals with that. You know, IDEA is only concerned with one major life activity. 504 is, is concerned with everything else. So I want to show you a, uh, what I call the four quadrant analysis. Now, I hope you don't find this simplistic. I hope you find it simple without being simplistic, but this is something I came up with a few years ago. And I did this based upon the two criteria that make a student eligible for special education. And you know this, what does it take for a student to get an IEP to be eligible under IDEA? Number one, they have to have one of the disabilities that's listed in the law, a learning disability, autism, 
other health impairment, serious emotional disturbance, etc. They have to have that. And secondly, they have to have a need. They have, you know, we know that having the disability in and of itself does not get you an IEP. You have to have a need for specially designed instruction. You know, what I forgot to get up here is water. I wonder if somebody could grab me a bottle of water and bring it up here and, and, and whenever you have time to do that. So that's quadrant four. So on the right, we have kids with disabilities. And on the lower half, we have kids who need SDI specially designed instruction. Okay, so quadrant four, that's your special ed students. And what is that? Maybe about 10% of your student population. So if we have two criteria, people are going to fall into four categories. You know, right now, if we divided the room into men, women, under 45, over 45, we could split into four groups. So quadrant one, that's your regular ed students. No disability, no need for specially designed instruction. The valedictorian is probably quadrant one. Most of you were probably quadrant one. But there's also pretty mediocre students in quadrant one. Thank you very much. Oh, that's not water. Oh, it is water. It's vitamin water. It's mine. I haven't opened it. Do you want it? No, it's fine. You're giving me your personal water. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was cranberry juice or something. All right. So, uh, so quadrant one is going to have some kids who have a hard time in math, maybe, uh, have a hard time with uh, languages other than English, uh, maybe don't always apply themselves as well as they should. But overall, there, you know, there may be strengths and weaknesses. There's nothing that would constitute a disability. And they don't need anything special. They need to be taught by a good teacher. They need to apply themselves. And they'll do fine in school. 12 years, add water and sleep, they'll get a diploma. OK, so that's quadrant one. Now quadrant two is 504. And these are the kids who have a disability. It's just it doesn't require specially designed instruction. That's it in a nutshell. So that girl with an eating disorder, that student in a wheelchair, uh, the student with asthma, real good candidates for 504. What's three? Well, I'm expanding the definition of specially designed instruction just a little bit. Now that term is a special ed term, specially designed instruction. But if you look at the definition of it, the definition of special, thank you. Now I'm going to have to take a bathroom break before I finish. All right. So, uh, <laughs> the definition of specially designed instruction is uh, adapting, changing, adapting the content, the method, or the delivery of instruction. I think we do that for kids that are not in special ed. Think about it. Do you alter? That is not going to hold up. I got Now, all right. I have to quit playing with this because y'all are going to be distracted by the presenter then had fun with a bottle of water. Okay. Do you all alter the content of your instruction for your English language learners? I think you do. Do you alter the uh, method of, of instruction or the delivery of instruction for students who are uh, slow learners? I don't think there's an official definition of slow learners. My understanding has always been kids that are kind of below average cognitively. They're not so far below average that we would classify them as having an intellectual disability. But school's gotten faster for those kids. They haven't gotten slower. School's gotten faster. We've ratcheted up our standards in education with standardized tests that are getting tougher, with expectations that standards be raised. So we have kids that we're providing some special instruction for them uh, because otherwise they won't pass the standardized test. WBFWR is something you will not see in professional literature. It's, I made it up. It's way behind for whatever reason. Okay. Now, if you want an umbrella term here, it's at risk. At risk. What is WBFWR? I bet your schools are loaded with kids like that. These are kids who may be very bright and may be very hardworking, but they're struggling in school. And perhaps it's because of trauma. Perhaps it's because of poverty. Perhaps it's because of dysfunction in the home. Perhaps it's because of criminal activity, exposure to violence. A lot of stuff like that that kids are exposed. None of that makes them eligible for special ed. None of that is a disability that qualifies for special ed, but it sure requires some special attention. So I think we've got a lot of quadrant three kids that need and should get specially designed instruction, 
but it's not due to a disability, so that's quadrant three. So I hope you find that a little bit helpful. <clears throat> it's not real precise. You could have, certainly we have students who have one foot in one quadrant and another foot in the other. <clears throat> and certainly you have students for whom different districts might approach it differently. District A might say, we think we can serve this student under 504. District B might say, uh, no, we think this is a quadrant one student. I mean, there's judgment calls to be made here. But I hope you find it just a little bit helpful anyway in, in trying to figure out who goes where and what we're doing. So DC versus Klein, <clears throat> to me, was a wake-up call. Well, it really confirmed what our firm has been recommending for quite some time. Start with the major life activity. What's the major life activity you're concerned about? And that's not hard to figure out. The parent will tell you that right off the bat. My, my child doesn't, uh, you know, it's behavior, it's learning, it's eating, it's sleeping, it's whatever. What's the major life activity? And if the major life activity has something to do with learning, I would just suggest to you it might be a good idea to think about IDEA. So that's DC versus Klein. All right, so uh, there's also, I want to call attention to uh, child find under uh, section 504 because, and this maybe is a little bit more for the lawyers than for the educators, but I think, I think you ought to hear this. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes see cases alleging that the school district failed in its child find responsibility under 504. I think that's kind of mythology because this is what the regulation says. The regulation, this is, this is the entirety of 504 regulations about child find. It says a recipient, that means a recipient of federal funds, that operates a public elementary or secondary education program shall annually, not constantly, annually. I think of annually as something I do once a year. I have a birthday annually. It just happens once a year. Annually, you will do something. What do you do? Undertake to identify and locate every qualified handicapped person. Notice how old this law is. We don't call people handicapped anymore but it's, it's still in the regulations. Who is not receiving a public education? So does the school district have any responsibility to child find the kids that are already in our school? Not according to that. That says we have a responsibility to reach out to the kids that are not in our school, to make sure that they are aware that services are available. The private school kids, the home school kids, the kids who are not enrolled in our public school. That's what the regulation says. So uh, I, I just think that, uh, that any court that says the school district violated child find under 504 is off base. Because that's, you know, it just doesn't square with the regulations. Okay, so let's compare child find under IDEA, child find under 504. Child find under IDEA, we locate, identify, and we evaluate. 504 just says identify and locate. Doesn't carry a responsibility to do an evaluation. IDEA says it's an ongoing responsibility. You know, we always have the responsibility of keeping an eye on our students to see who may need special education. 504, annually you do something. IDEA applies to all the students. And 504 specifically says it's applicable to those kids who are not in, uh, enrolled in public school, okay? So another thing about 504 is it applies to all school activities, including extracurriculars. I remember, uh, you know, you probably heard that football is a pretty big deal in Texas. So one time I had a conference call. I love conference calls because there's multiple people on the other end of the phone, and they're usually having an argument, and I'm going to settle it, <laughs> or I'm at least going to be the tiebreaker, you know? And so uh, I got this call, and it was the special education director and the head football coach. And I picked up the vibes pretty quickly. I could tell that the student they were calling me about, the coach didn't want him on the team, all right? Now, the coach had kicked him off the team the year before, and the student had, was in um, special ed. He was a special ed student. I don't remember why, but he, he had an IEP. He's in special ed. He got kicked off the football team last year for some sort of misconduct. And the parents didn't complain about it. But it's time to start practices again, and, 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 uh, and the kid wants to be on the team for the, for the next year. Coach doesn't want him. It's pretty obvious to me. And the, and the special ed director is worried about this. 
So I get this phone call, and, um, and so I start asking questions. I said, Coach, uh, have you kicked kids off the team before? Yes, we do it fairly often. You know, we don't do it a lot, but we sometimes have to do it. Well, when you kick them off, how long do you normally kick them off? The rest of that season. Have you ever permanently barred a student from your foot? No. So, well, this probably wouldn't be a good test case for that then, you know. I, I think if you've never done that before, let, let's not do that to this student. He said, okay, I figured you'd say that. But he's got to follow our rules. I said, yes, sir, coach, absolutely, he has to follow your rules. But you have to reasonably accommodate him. He said, what are you talking about? I said, he's in special ed, right? Yeah. You have to reasonably accommodate him. Well, this is extracurricular. This is a privilege, not a right. This is football. You know, he doesn't have to be on the football team. I know that. This is a program operated by the school district. We have a responsibility under 504. He's not in 504, he's IDEA, right. But if he's under IDEA, he has a disability, right? We have a duty not to discriminate on the basis of disability. And that means we have to reasonably accommodate him in all of our activities, and that would include football. So, see, I want you to understand how lawyers think. What am I thinking? The lawyer's job is to anticipate something bad happening six months down the road and put you in the best possible position if that happens. I, this coach is gonna kick this kid off the team again. I can tell. I think that, uh, I, you know, I do remember the disability. He was, he was emotionally disturbed, the student. And you know, my experience with Texas football coaches is they want as many emotionally disturbed football players. <laughs> I mean, it helps. It's a violent game, you know? So I knew something about this kid. This kid is a small, unathletic, emotionally disturbed student. Because <laughs> otherwise he'd be the linebacker. And so I can see this, this coach is probably gonna kick the kid off the, off, the school, off the football squad. And what's my job? My job is to make sure that if that happens, the school district has a defensible legal position. So I wanna make sure that the coach knows, you gotta do something that's a little above and beyond for this student. Why don't you sit him down and have a one-to-one -one conversation and make sure he understands the rules and the consequences and all that? Why don't you have a written contract with this student? You don't do that for all the boys on your team, do you? No. Well, do it for this student. And he blew up at me. He said, you know, you don't understand. I don't have time to meet with this kid before every practice. I've only got 10 assistant coaches here. And it was a, it was a pretty good program, this school. And I said, coach, I'm not talking about doing it every day before practice. Do it once before you start your two-a-days. I wanted him to hear me say two-a-days to establish street cred, you know? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I just tell you that story uh, because we have a duty to provide reasonable accommodation in all of our activities, including extracurricular activities. What if the students not, what if we have room for 15 basketball players on our varsity basketball team and everybody else gets put on the junior varsity? That's a legitimate, that's fine, but when you have in the tryouts for the kids, measure the ability, not the disability. Give everybody a tryout. And if the student's not a very good basketball player, then they're on the junior varsity. You know, I had a case, I had a question like that too. We had a visually impaired basketball player that a school district asked me about. He's not completely blind, but he's, he's visually impaired, which tells me he's probably not gonna be a great basketball player, because you, know, you have to have good vision to be a good basketball player. Uh, and I said, you know, how, how many kids are on your basketball team? We've never caught anybody, it's a small school. I said, well then he's on the team. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. Now if it's a big school, if it's an Indiana school with a great basketball tradition, and you take the 15 best players, then you give them a tryout, and you measure his ability. And you don't say anything about his disability other than efforts you made to accommodate it to make sure that the tryouts were fair. There's a case in here that's kind of like that. It's the Clemens case. And uh, let's see, I think, I've, I think I passed it over. Yeah, it's at the bottom of page five. This is a colorful fact situation. That's one of the nice things about school law. We have such colorful cases. You know, my brother-in-law is an oil and gas lawyer and he makes a gazillion dollars, but nobody wants to hear his stories. You know, but we got stories in school law. This is a girl who threw tennis rackets at the coach. That's not good. This is a mother who told the coach, I know you have an autistic son too. I hope this happens to him only twice as bad. Karma, baby. <laughs> but the coach made the mistake of telling somebody, this girl's not gonna be on the team, and he said that before tryouts. So the case is still alive. Possible 
disability discrimination, okay? So we want to be careful about all the activities that the school is involved in. All right, let's see. Here's my most exciting slide. What's the movie? Who's the actor? What's he saying? My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. He said it like six times, remember? We should remember, okay? That's not the quote I want to give you. There's another famous quote from The Princess Bride by Inigo Montoya. What is it? I do not think that word means what you think it means. Do you remember that? You keep using that word. What was the word? Inconceivable. I do not think that word means what you think it means. I bring that up in the, in the context of 504 because of the word intentional discrimination. Now, you know, when I think of intentional discrimination, I think of the news clips I've seen from the 1950s, white, colored. I'd call that intentional discrimination. I'd call what happened to Rosa Parks intentional discrimination. And unfortunately, these days, we see a lot of examples of hateful, malicious discrimination based on race or religion um, or sex. That's what I think of when I think of intentional discrimination. You need to know that under 504 and ADA, it has a little bit different meaning. That Round Rock case I told you about, the eating disorder, the journalism teacher, I really doubt that that journalism teacher held any ill will toward that student. I mean, I don't know the journalism teacher, but I know teachers. And she probably thought she was doing a kind thing uh, to, to have the student involved in a yearbook. But the court said, if you know about a 504 plan and you intentionally decide not to implement it, that is intentional discrimination. So it doesn't take ill will. And Julie talked about uh, the same case I'm mentioning here, the Lake Washington case. I've got it at the top of page seven here. Uh, this is a student's 504 plan called for her to stay inside when it was raining, damp, or below 60 degrees. She would be supervised while doing indoor activities, et cetera. For whatever reason, they didn't do that. Might have been even an understandable reason. <clears throat> but that's what intentional discrimination is, not proof of ill will, malice, or, vote, or vert discrimination. Knowing there's a plan, choosing not to implement it, that's enough. And again, this doesn't impose liability on the person who did it, it imposes liability on the school district due to responding at superior, okay? So let's move on to behaviors. Lots of cases about FUBAs and BIPs. That's what I call them, FUBAs and BIPs. They go together like salsa and chips, there you go. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a whole section in here on attorney's fees. We're skipping that. Uh, you know, it's un unfortunately true that an awful lot of the litigation these days is more about attorney's fees than anything else. I think every lawyer involved in special ed will say that. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's been an un un unfortunate consequence of legalizing this area of educational practice. Uh, so you can read them. You may find it interesting. There's some pretty big dollars thrown around in some of these cases. But that's for the lawyers, and this conference is mostly for the educators, so I'm skipping over that. Let's go on to behavior. Uh, Spring Branch versus OW. Uh, this is the case that uh, I was very pleased to see the ruling on these points because it verified what I had been telling folks in Texas. Uh, at every annual IEP meeting, we ask this question, does the student have behaviors that impede the learning of the student or others? We ask that every time. You got that on your forms, right? and you have a yes box, you have a no box, and if you check yes, that creates an obligation that you will address it. It doesn't necessarily require that you write a behavior plan, a formal behavior plan for the student, but it does require that you address it in some way. So uh, <clears throat> they're required under IDEA when the school seeks a change of placement based on behavior that is a manifestation of disability. So for example, if we have a student with an emotional disturbance who's acting out in ways that are predictable based upon the student's emotional disturbance, that's behavior that is a manifestation of disability. And uh, the school under IDEA would be required to address that. Uh, and not just in any way, but with a functional behavioral assessment and a BIP. So, <clears throat> Some things about BIPs, in, in the, uh, I've got a breakout session I did uh, two times yesterday, so those of you who were there for that, this is, you're gonna hear some of the same thing. 
Uh, there's no definition in federal law. There is quite a bit of regulation here in Indiana that I noticed about behavior plans. It says that the behavior plan must be developed by the case conference committee. So, I mean, it might be proposed by an individual teacher or behavior specialist or school psych, but it has to come to the case conference committee and be approved. So the parent has a seat at the table with that. Um, and, uh, and it also says that a behavior plan must be a part of the student's IEP. So you've got a little more specific regulations about it than a lot of states do. Uh, you know, my summary about uh, behavior plans is it's not what you're gonna do to the student, it's what you're gonna do for the student. You have another document that spells out what you're gonna do to the student. It's called your code of conduct. That's where you list all the thou shalt nots, and that's where you list all the negative consequences that may befall the student if they violate any of that. Uh, you know, I, I think you're missing something. I have yet to see, you know, there's a lot of codes of conduct in Texas that list 37 negative things that the school might do to the student. We'll kick you off of the basketball team. We'll suspend you from school. We'll send you to an alternative school. We won't let you walk at graduation. There's all these negative consequences. Never have I seen one that says, we will make you write long sentences with big words hundreds of times. And it's just a personal complaint of mine because when I was in high school, I wrote long sentences with big words hundreds of times. I was in a boarding school, so they had us 24-7. It was a Catholic school, so there was no, no constitutional protection. They had not ratified the United States Constitution. And, uh, and I got in trouble one year because I was on the dishwashing crew and we were being too rowdy with the songs we were singing. We were bothering Sister Mary Holywater, who was the cook, you know. So Father McGlinchey came in and with a spark in his eye because he liked this kind of thing. And he said, I'll see you men tomorrow after classes. Anytime he called us, you men, it was not gonna be good. So he got us the next day after classes about three o'clock, we sat in the study hall. He said, pull out a tablet of paper and pull out a pen and I want you to write this down. And he started dictating. <clears throat> this stupid assignment, which is a monumental waste of time should be a reminder to me that I lack respect for the rights of others, period. Furthermore, as a result of this stupid assignment, when I am called upon to perform duties in the kitchen in the future, I will endeavor to do so in a more gentlemanly fashion. How many times do you think I wrote that? 500. All right. I don't know why you don't have that in your code of conduct. You know, I'm a better man for it. You know. <laughs> I'm very gentlemanly in the kitchen these days. You could ask my wife, you know. I have a good, I've got good vocabulary. I've heard teachers say, oh, you can't make kids write things. They'll associate writing with bad things. I'm pretty much a professional writer. So I'm just waiting for somebody to do that, but you, but you don't. So anyway, the code of conduct is where you put all the stuff that you might do to the student. The BIP is where you're talking about what you can do for the student because the student's behavior is impeding learning. And I want to point out to you that when we ask that question, does the student's behavior impede learning? That question is not limited to the behaviors that arise from the disability. It could have nothing to do with the disability. Does it impede learning of the student or others? Therefore, a lot of behaviors that are, we typically think of as not a manifestation of disability should generate thinking about a behavior plan. Possession of drugs at school. You know, when I've dealt with schools on that, they'll say, well, that's not, that has nothing to do with a disability. And probably it doesn't, probably it doesn't. But this is a separate question. Does it impede learning of the student or others? I think so. Uh, I think so. That's one of the reasons why we don't permit it. Students having sex in the bathroom. Does that impede learning of the student or others? I think, I mean, it, it, it advances learning in some respects. <laughs> They're certainly learning something. We know the function of the behavior, but does it impede learning of the student or others? Well, I think it does. Is that a behavior that we need to address? I think so. So uh, the BIPs are not the place to authorize short-term removals, physical restraint, or bringing in law enforcement. You don't need to put that in a BIP. None of that is what you're gonna do for the student. That's what you do to the student. Restraint is very restricted in Indiana, as it is elsewhere. Uh, it's only in an emergency. It's only to prevent greater harm. 
You know, the, the, the rule of thumb with restraint is we do that when the failure to do it would lead to greater harm. That's when we do it. And we have to be trained and we have to document and we have to be sure the parent knows about it. But you don't, I wouldn't put, don't put that in a behavior plan. That's not a positive behavior intervention support or strategy, okay? And there's some cases that tell us that it's the failure to implement a behavior plan that could be serious. So a couple of cases I want to talk about, Spring Branch versus OW. This is one of the cases, this went to the Fifth Circuit and they verified what I've been saying for a long time. You don't have to authorize physical restraint in a behavior plan, it's already authorized. Colonial School District versus NS down at the bottom 11. The court said that the di district failed to develop a consistent and systematic plan to address inappropriate behaviors. Court noted the district needed parent consent to do a behavior plan, but it never sought consent. In Indiana, uh, if you want to do a functional behavioral assessment by virtue of just reviewing existing data that you've already got, you don't need consent for that. But if you want to do something beyond that, to add to your FBA, you need consent. And here's a case where the court said, uh, this is a kid who uh, clearly needs a behavior plan, and the district hasn't even taken the first step of requesting consent for the, from the parents to do that. Enterprise City Board of Education versus SS the next, uh, on the next page from Alabama. The IEP stated that the student had behaviors that impeded learning. There was ample evidence to support that, but the school did not develop a BIP. And you look at the comment here, the court said that there are some students for whom a behavior plan is obviously needed, and this was one of them. But there was, so sometimes just the failure to have a behavior plan can be a denial of a free appropriate public education. SS versus Board of Education, if you were in my uh, sessions yesterday, this is the case we talked about specifically about the, the, the school district's failure to follow its own data in developing uh, the behavior plan, so that can be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> Elizabeth versus El Paso County, the court held the IEP did not have to include a BIP, but behavioral interventions needed to be considered. They were considered, they were deemed unnecessary. This was based on the testimony of seven district witnesses that said the same thing. Now that's a solid foundation for the district to refuse to write a BIP, all right? They said, you know, we think we can address this through some informal observations. Seven district witnesses, you know, who are the most important witnesses in a special ed due process hearing? The people who spend the most time in the classroom with the student. They are more important than the person with the PhD and the book that he's written and the elbow patches on the tweed jacket. That may be a very good expert, but they don't know the student as well. And so seven district witnesses said the same thing. The court's gonna go with that. And so, you know, we don't always have to write a behavior plan. This is when they thought about it and they said, we think some common behavioral interventions will work. Downington case, court affirmed a hearing officer's ruling that the district's failure to addre effectively address behavior denied FAPE. Record showed the district was aware of behavioral problems. District made no progress in addressing them during kindergarten, first grade. They did do an FBA in February of the first grade year. Changes were put in place in May. That really means they're in effect for the next year. And the court said that's a little bit too late. So, you know, we have a responsibility to do these things and to act promptly. So, so those are just some illustrations of how uh, behavior itself uh, can, can raise some legal issues for us. Okay, talk about discipline a little bit. There is a FAPE-free zone. I want you all to use that term. I'm going to count to three and ask you to say FAPE-free zone with some enthusiasm. One, two, three. FAPE-free zone. Good for you. I think if you Google it, you might come across some of my materials. I do claim credit for it. I think I came up with it. It was inspired by God. God told me you need to have a name for these first 10 days because you got people confused all over the place. I said, what do you think about Faith Free Zone? And the Lord God Almighty said, it is good. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Now this is the, there, there, are, there is a 10 day rule. This is, this is authority that principals have to unilaterally, unilaterally, no case conference committee, no parent consent, unilaterally remove the student from the placement that the IEP puts the student in. And they can do this, but they can only do this for 10 days during the course of the entire school year. This Whitaker case is a case where the district exceeded the fate-free zone by a little bit. Uh, district acknowledged it had removed the student from the IEP placement for disciplinary reasons for 16 days. Well, 16 is more than 10. 
At an IEP team meeting, the team determined the behaviors that led to the removals were manifestations of the student's disability. Now, you know, if they had only done 10 days, and even if they had been manifestations of the disability, that would not be a legal problem. It is a FAPE-free zone, which means that it might be based on behavior that's a manifestation, uh, and no services are needed. It's FAPE-free. The district is not obligated to provide FAPE for those 10 days. Now, they went over it. Uh, the district offered compensatory services to make up for the excessive removals. And the hearing officer in the court found the district's offer to be an adequate remedy. So the district realizes after the fact, oop, we goofed. We went over 10 days. We will make up for it by offering some sort of compensatory services that will make up for the six days that the student was not served. Good enough, OK? Christine versus Hope Township. You know, I read this case, and I was very sympathetic to the school situation here, but the court simply applied the law and said the district violated it. Now, let's look at the comment first. A lot of extenuating circumstances in this case. This student was new to the district. The student came in with behavioral issues that were far more serious than what the school was told. Uh, the hearing officer in the court noted that the parent was less than candid about the student's condition. And the previous school failed to forward some of the important records. So some of you maybe have been in that situation. We get a new student. We think we're dealing with one thing. And really, we have a student with far more serious situation. But the parent hasn't been totally transparent. And the records haven't arrived. And so what do we do? Hope Township did not sit on its hands during those 17 days. What were the 17 days? They unilaterally removed the student and offered no services for 17 days. All right. Now, like I say, I think there were some extenuating circumstances. And they did not sit on their hands during those 17 days. They're scrambling around trying to find some place to serve this student. But the kid misses 17 days of school, and there was no case conference committee. Unilateral removal is, is limited to 10 school days. <clears throat> what the school could have done, once they realized we're going to need a little more than 10 days here, they could have asked for an expedited hearing. They could have asked for a hearing, because they, they can do that. But what they can't do is just do it by a unilateral order. So that's that case. Uh, Gloria versus Wimberley, this is a case our firm was involved in. This is a, you know, this is a manifestation case. Student was charged with stealing an all-terrain vehicle. And the parent said it was, you know, he's impulsive, bless his heart. And the court didn't buy it. The uh, Texas, we call it an ARD committee. The ARD committee didn't buy it. Uh, the court didn't buy it. The hearing officer didn't buy it. But it's just an interesting illustration of uh, manifestation determinations. The question is, uh, do, did the disability cause the misconduct? And what the court said is, you know, stealing an ATV is a lot different from stealing a cookie. Stealing a cookie might very well be impulsive. I can relate to that. I've probably swiped a cookie or two in my life, just based on I want the cookie. Uh, but the court pointed out that to steal the ATV, the student had to plan it. There had to be some thought going into it. He had to figure out how he's going to get away with it. It wasn't impulsive. It was not a manifestation of disability. There you go. So <clears throat> we talked about unilateral removal and so on, and then there's that case. OK, let's talk about eligibility. ISD number 283, page 15. I don't get it with the states that number their school districts. I mean, surely they have a name as well, but how would you like to go to high school number 283? How does that spark school spirit, you know? Go 283, beat 175. I, I don't get it. So <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a case that illustrates uh, one more thing not to say at a case conference committee, all right? I used to do a presentation called 10 Things Not to Say. At, a, at an ARD meeting in Texas. And I quit doing it because I violated one of my own rules. One of my rules was, let's not get personal. You know, let's maintain our professional standards. And, and even if we feel insulted or angry, let's, let's be professional. Well, I violated my own rules. I was at this meeting, and the parent was represented by a lawyer who was really driving me crazy, asking the same question 17 times because he wasn't getting the answer that he wanted. The meeting has lasted way longer than it should have. I'm getting very frustrated. And I finally blew up at him. And I don't remember what I said. 
except the last two words were, you bozo. <laughs> we had a professional dialogue, the other lawyer and I, at that point. He said, am not. <laughs> I'm a skilled professional myself, you know. R2. <laughs> Principal jumped up and said, let's take a break. So we did, and Bozo and his client went out into the hall, and you know, I felt kind of embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry about that. I lost my temper and I blew up at that guy. I apologize. The principal said, oh, we liked it. <laughs> it gave me a whole new insight into you people. So, so, I, so I quit doing 10 things not to say. But if I were doing 10 things not to say, this would be one of them I'd add to the list. She's too smart to be in special ed. Somebody actually told the parent that. Oh, you're, you're so smart. She can't be in special ed. Uh, well, that's just wrong, all right? Now, this was a very bright student. And when she showed up at school, she did great. And when they gave her a standardized test, she did great. So she was real smart. What was the problem? She wasn't coming to school. They disenrolled her from the school three years in a row for failure to attend without ever offering an evaluation to look into the possibility that there were some mental health issues here that were contributing to her not coming to school. And some, uh, one teacher said, you know, well, she's too smart. If she goes into special ed, she'll have to drop all those advanced placement classes. No. <laughs> so let's be sure, you know, and I think the people I'm speaking to know this, but not all the people that you work for, that work for you, know this. So be sure that that word gets, gets passed around here, okay? So let's see, what else do we have here under eligibility? William versus Coppers Cove. Uh, this is a case where people uh, were concerned by the district court's decision. You notice this is the Fifth Circuit. But the district court made a, made a ruling that shook people up, at least in Texas, and I think to some extent around the country. Because what the district court judge said was, if the district identifies you as having dyslexia, you are automatically eligible for special ed. No further questions need to be asked. Really. Uh, that's what the district court said. The, uh, and so we were, there was a lot of concern about will the Fifth Circuit affirm that kind of logic. They didn't. They did rule in favor of the school district on this case, but on another basis. But I will tell you, this is not the first case where a court, where a judge said that a school, one of the things the, school, the court said in this case is, what you're calling dyslexia services is really special education services. This is not the first case where a court has said what you're calling general ed services is really special ed. You're committing special ed without realizing it. Now how can that be? The courts are looking at the definition of specially designed instruction. Did you change the content, the method, or the delivery of the instruction? I think you do that for students with dyslexia. Did you do it because of a disability? Look at the definition of specific learning disability. It gives examples of things that qualify. Guess what one of them is? Dyslexia. Now, I do not think that every student with dyslexia qualifies for special education, but they are candidates. It's possible, and I think the wise, prudent, conservative course for the school district is to make sure that the parent knows we will do an evaluation to look into this thoroughly if you'd like us to. Here's our consent form if you want to sign. That takes care of your child fine responsibility right there. If you've offered that evaluation and the parent says, no, thank you, I don't think you have a child fine problem. Uh, and then we monitor how the student is doing. And if the student is not doing well with whatever we do provide, then we bring it back up. You know, we offered you an IDE evaluation last year. You didn't want it. We agreed to that. Six months down the road, your student's still struggling an awful lot. Would you like to reconsider? That type of thing and the documentation of that goes a long way toward protecting the school district from a child fine problem, okay? So she's too smart to be in special ed. We don't want to say that. Uh, how do we serve students with dyslexia? That's the uh, Copper's Cove case. And RTI sometimes can be a good thing. Are you all doing RTI, response to intervention? I'm sure you are. Uh, there are a couple of cases here I want to call your attention to about that. Let's look at GM versus, what is that? Merit, Martirano, Martirano. Court affirmed the uh, ALJ, that's administrative law judge decision, the student was not eligible despite having both dyslexia and ADHD. 
I think that's correct. Not every student with dyslexia needs specially designed instruction, and not all of them have a learning disability. The IEP team determines this student's dyslexia did not meet the criteria for a learning disability, but you see, they did look into it. They did look into it. They did the evaluation. And the ADHD did not require specially designed instruction. So there you go. Mini Tonka public schools. I put this in here mainly because I just enjoy saying the word mini Tonka. That just trips off the tongue. It's like couscous. I can never remember what couscous is, but when I see it on a menu, I have to say it three or four times because it's just couscous. You know, it's just a nice thing. Uh, court held the district's failure to identify dyslexia and ADHD as the student's primary disability was not a harmless misclassification. If you've come to conferences like this, you've heard people like Julie and David Hodgins and me say that the label doesn't matter much as long as you're providing appropriate services. There's lots of cases that say that. But here's the thing about the law. There's always the case that says, well, not always. This is the case that says, not always. This is a case where the court said, you got the wrong label on the kid. Uh, I think they had the student as, uh, what did they have him? They, had him, they did, identified him as autism as the primary disability. Of course, said, you're missing the boat. The primary disability is a reading problem, is dyslexia, it's a, and, and, and you should be, and you're, and, and one of the lessons of this case is that student progress is the gold standard. The problem for the school district in this case is that the student continued to uh, fall further and further behind his peers, particularly in reading, despite the fact that everybody agreed that he was bright enough and working hard, uh, but he's not making much progress. So the court said it's not a harmless misclassification. If you'd identified him as having dyslexia and ADHD, you probably would have provided different services and maybe he would have done better. So that one's kind of an interesting one. Okay, let's see, how we're doing on time. All right, we're doing good. So ESY. I'm going to use ESY to introduce you to what I call the one-size-fits-all answer. Wouldn't you like to have a one-size-fits-all answer to questions that, that people raise at IEP meetings? I think there is one, and I'm going to introduce you to it. But I'm going to use this topic to bring it up. What's ESY? Extended school year, right? This is the provision of services to students for more than the typical nine months because the disability requires it. And, you know, it's routine now. It's a part of the landscape that we, that we live in. It wasn't always that way. Uh, you know, in the early days of special ed, it didn't say anything about extended school year services. It said you will provide students with a free, appropriate public education. And there were no specific regulations about extended school year services. So in my imagination, I sometimes wonder, where is the parent in America who was the first one to raise this issue? Because I can just imagine the response, you know? Parent comes to the school, maybe talks to the special education director, maybe it's March or April, and the parent says, you know, I, I really think my child is going to need services after school ends, like during the summer. W would you be willing to provide services to my child during the summer? Imagine what the response would be when there was no legal mandate to provide ESY, when we didn't know the term, when there weren't lots of court cases about it, I think the response would have been, well, I'm sorry, that's not something we offer. You know, it's not funded and we don't have the staff and the buildings are all being renovated during the summer. It's just not something that we do. Sorry about that. We'll see your child next fall. And the parent might say, well, I, I just don't think that's fair. I mean, my child needs a little bit more. Well, it's the same thing that every, everybody gets the same number of days of instruction. I mean, your child is in the school and receiving 180 days. Of, I mean, it's the same as everybody else. So that parent took it to court. And what the court told us is that the same is not necessarily equal. And, and the court said, you know, for some kids, free appropriate public education involves extended school year services. So now we think it's routine. But I bring that up because I want you thinking for a second about how do you respond to the question that catches you off guard. Now I'm specifically talking about questions that have to do with IEP content. So let me give you some examples. I mean, if it were ESY, I know how you'd respond to that now. You'd say, oh, we'll talk about that at our IEP meeting, con case conference committee. But what if the parent asked for a one-to-one -one aid? Uh, or the parent asked for uh, 40 hours of applied behavioral analysis or something. 
that is a pretty, exp a pretty expansive extension or addition to what we're currently doing. I've really thought about this and I, I have come up with what I think is a one-size-fits-all answer to address that, that kind of question. So here it is, uh, this, and this is a good opportunity to bring it up. Design for responding to requests for an upgrade in services as per the IEP. I want something added to the IEP. I want more speech therapy. I want more, uh, I might want new uh, technology devices or whatever. Here's the answer. Well, let me take that to the IEP team in Indiana, case conference committee. Let me take that to the case conference committee. They will review the evaluation data that we have regarding your child, and they will determine if your child needs that service in order to receive a free appropriate public education. And if they decide your child does need it, we'll put it in the IEP and we'll provide it. Now why do I think that's a good response? I think it hits on all of the elements that we need to hit on to be legally defensible. Frequently, the response to a question like that is, well, I'll talk to the principal about it, or I'll talk to the special education director about it. And that's the wrong response because they don't have the authority to make that call. Who has the authority to make this call? The case conference committee. So let's start off by making sure that we're informing the parent that we're gonna take this to the group that can answer your question, that can say yes or no, okay? So we're gonna take it to the case conference committee. What are they gonna base it on? Evaluation data. Here's your four critical components to that answer. IEP team, evaluation data. Evaluation data is to the case conference committee as admissible evidence is to a jury. Everything has to be based upon that. What's the standard that the team will apply? If your child needs it in order to receive a free appropriate public education, then we will do it. If it's not needed, we'll give you prior written notice explaining why we're not gonna do it. That's the standard, okay? And so that's what I think would be a, a, a good, I think that's a good one size fits all answer. It hits on all components of that. So let's take a look at it again. Who has the authority to answer questions about IEP content? You know, this is how special ed is different from everything else. Special ed decision making comes from the case conference committee. In almost everything else in school operations, decisions come from administration. Right now, a lot of districts are debating whether kids can be required to wear masks and when a parent asks about that, what's the proper response? Uh, we'll see what the superintendent says. We'll see what the school board says. Or, you know, take the parent with a Title IX complaint. I don't think the girls' basketball team has good uniforms. They're wearing uniforms that are 30 years old. The boys get new uniforms every two years. I think that violates Title IX. We'll take that up with the athletic director. So if it's anything other than special ed, we take it to the appropriate administrator. If it's special ed, we take it to the case conference committee and the parent is right there, okay? So, so you get it? We're not excluding the parent. We would be excluding the parent if we did it any other way. Because if we say the director will decide, well, then the director decides. And this, one way school districts get in trouble is when a high-ranking administrator dictates IEP content uh, rather than it coming from the case conference committee. So, so I think it's a one, I've looked at it from all sides, I've cross-examined myself over this, I've tried to figure out where are the holes in this, I can't find it. If it's about IEP content, I want a one-to-one -one aid. I want more ESY than you're, asked, than you're offering to provide me. I want a new assistive technology device. One simple answer. Well, we'll take that up with the case conference committee. We'll look at the evaluation data. If it looks like your child needs it, we'll do it. All right? So, <clears throat> exhaustion. Oh, what a good topic. There's a whole slew of cases in here about exhaustion of administrative remedies. In fact, there's 14 cases, number of them at the circuit court level. I didn't see anything from the Seventh Circuit. There's probably something, but uh, this is for the lawyers and I think we probably do have some lawyers in the group, but this is for the lawyers, it's not for you all, but it's a legal doctrine that parents cannot go straight to court with a lawsuit. They have to exhaust their administrative remedies. They have to go through a special ed due process hearing. There's an unbelievable amount of confusion and litigation about how that works. And lawyers are always trying to find a workaround because they don't, frequently they don't want to mess with the special ed due process hearing, especially if they're trying to recover money damages. They want to take that right to court because that's the only way they can get that. Uh, and so the school districts will file a motion to dismiss. You didn't exhaust. So, so I just you know, want you to know about the terminology, but this is, a, this is a lawyer issue, not an educator issue. 
Okay, IEPs, IEP team meetings, case conference committees. Getting kind of used to that terminology. I think I'll go home and start talking about case conference committees. Um, let's see, so we're gonna skip forward several pages here. Uh, we're all the way over to uh, page 24 and the uh, Spring Branch case comes up again. Spring Branch versus OW. This is the highest level court that I've seen that addresses the procedure for amending an IEP without having a case conference committee. You know, you can do that. You can do that. And this is a really good case to, to read about because the school district did it twice, and one time they did it properly, and one time they did it improperly. And the difference is, the first time they changed the IEP, they had written documentation that the parent agreed to it and agreed to bypass the IEP team meeting. The second time they did it, they had a phone conversation with the parent, but they had nothing in writing to verify that the parent had agreed to it. So there is a procedure for amending an IEP without having a formal case conference committee. And this is the highest level court that I bumped into that's actually addressed the mechanics of how you do that. So it's a, it's a good one for you to take a look at. Down at the bottom of page 25, uh, Precati, Pre, Precchiato uh, versus uh, Clovis Municipal Schools from New Mexico. Court held the IEP was not reasonably calculated to confer appropriate progress, largely based on the fact that the student continued year after year to have similar goals and services despite a lack of progress. Student progress is the gold standard. You know, when we look at that question of does the student need it, does the student need it? How do you answer that question? You look at how the student's doing without it. <laughs> I mean, that's why Amy Rowley lost her case at the Supreme Court. You all know that case. This is a hearing impaired girl who wants a sign language interpreter. And she takes her case all the way to the US Supreme Court and she lost. Why? Because the court looked at the data about how she was doing without a sign language interpreter. She was doing very well. That would indicate that Maybe a sign language interpreter would be good, but it's not needed, it's not needed. But here's a case where the court is saying, you're throwing out the same goals and objectives every year and the student's not getting anywhere. That would indicate that there's a problem. So, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily a problem that the goals are similar from one year to the next, but if we're not making progress, uh, that's something we probably want to take a look at. Um, <clears throat> A lot of cases here about meaningful parent participation. We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, so let's see, got a lot of cases here. Didn't see much litigation here from Indiana, by the way. So it makes me wonder if you guys are doing your part to contribute to the case law around the country, you know? Let's generate a little litigation around here, shall we? It's, it's good for the rest, of the rest of the country. They appreciate that. Uh, Argby versus Downington, to switch over all the way to page 28. 28. I want you to know that there's quite a few cases where the focus is on baseline data. How can you say you have a measurable goal if you don't have some fairly specific baseline data? You know, those of you that were in my session yesterday, I, I, I used the analogy of IEPs are really goal setting things. It's just like a goal that we have personally to lose weight or to save money or to pay off debt. All of those are easy goals to understand. They're not easy goals to achieve, but they're easy goals to establish and to understand. If I want to lose 20 pounds, I have to know what I weigh right now, and I have to be able to subtract 20 and figure out what the goal is. If you don't have some fairly specific, measurable way of saying, here's where the student is, then how can you have a measurable goal a year later? So uh, this RB versus Downington is just one of several cases that have kind of called attention uh, to the requirement that we have um, uh, a good baseline data, okay? So <clears throat> a lot of these cases about IEP meetings in particular about how we conduct ourselves in case conference committees. And I will tell you, I have what I call the unwritten rule of special ed litigation. The un there's a lot of written rules about special ed litigation, but there's one what I believe to be an unwritten rule. And the unwritten rule is that I think that the hearing officers and the courts are always kind of quietly assessing the reasonableness of the parties. Has the school district treated this parent with courtesy and respect uh, and included them as an equal member of the team? Have the parents 
cooperated and collaborated with the school in good faith. And there's cases that go against the parties who have acted unreasonably. There's quite a few of them. So I think that, you know, it's not surprising to me that the hearing officers are assessing this factor because the whole foundation of special ed is built on a foundation that assumes good faith collaboration. I mean, think about it. Special ed litigation is a little bit odd. Everybody wants the same thing. You know, there's nobody involved in it that doesn't want the student to have a good experience at school. That's what the parent wants. That's what the teachers want. That's what the administrators want. That's what everybody wants. So the law assumes that these parties will act in good faith and work together collaboratively to come up with a plan. So if somebody acts unreasonably, it typically kind of goes against them. So as a lawyer for school districts, I always encourage you all to act reasonably, even under trying circumstances, and document the fact that you're doing it. You know, I've heard some really good sermons on Sunday where the preacher encourages us to do good things for other people anonymously. Don't let anybody know. I'm sure that's good advice for getting to heaven. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about staying out of court. And so I'm telling you, do good things for other people and by God, keep a record of it. So that you can show, really, a lot of these cases, it's the paper trail that reveals. How, how is a court, two years down the road, going to decide who acted reasonably at a case conference committee two years ago? How are they going to know that? It's the record. It's the testimony. So contemporaneous records of what's going on is important. So let's just, let me see, let me go on to some of the cases here, and then we'll go on into LRE. So let's see, actually I don't have anything. Oh yeah, there's only two I want to call your attention to. Page 31, JD versus Eastside Union High School District. I just wanted to highlight two cases, one of which kind of shows the parent acting unreasonably and one of them showing the school acting unreasonably. Eastside Union High School District, top of page 31. The administrative law judge conducted a six day hearing, issued a 42 page decision in favor of the district one of the issues was the father's complaint that the team never formally determined that his son was no longer eligible for special ed. You know, if you called my law firm and you said, we, uh, we're not providing special ed services for a student, we never formalized that at a case conference committee, I would tell you, well, that's a problem, buddy. That's a problem. What, but what did the court say? Uh, the court said the district did issue a prior written notice. They at least informed the parent. Now, they didn't, they didn't do it at the meeting where they're supposed to do it, but at least they informed them. And, and my comment is this is unorthodox, but the court said the record amply shows that an IEP team determination was not possible here due to the actions of the father. So this is a dad acting unreasonably. Court said uh, the father was domineering, repeatedly interrupting others, preventing them from presenting their reports. He repeatedly canceled meetings that were scheduled. The court is looking at who is acting reasonably. Now the next case, Bellflower versus Jimenez, the court held the district failure to hold the annual IEP meeting was a procedural violation that significantly impeded parent participation. You have to have an annual case conference committee. There's no getting around that. They didn't do it. Why did they not do it? They found it difficult to work with the parent. The court says basically we'll get over it. Yeah, some parents are difficult to work with. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't excuse your responsibility to the student. Have the meeting. And if the parent is unreasonable in the meeting, document that the parent is unreasonable in the meeting. But have the meeting. And so, you know, these things kind of work either way. So we'll return to this unwritten rule a little bit later. Let's talk just a little bit about least restrictive environment. Not a whole lot going on here. But I thought the Highland Park case was interesting. This is one, our firm handled this case. And, and it's the only case I've ever seen that positively mentions reverse inclusion. That is not a term that's in the law. It's a term I've heard districts use uh, as a means of, of t inviting the general ed students to come into the life skills room or to have lunch with the students with severe disabilities. And it's just a way, you know, for those students who, for, for whom there's not much opportunity for interaction with the mainstream students. The idea of bringing in those students uh, to be with the, the uh, students with the more severe disabilities is, a a positive mood on behalf of the school. In fact, we have a, one of the new lawyers in our law firm, uh, we were talking about this recently, and she said, she said, you know, I now remember that she said when I was in high school, 
I was doing this. I was one of those students who went into the life skills room to spend some time with the students with disabilities. I didn't know that was reverse inclusion. So kind of interesting. So uh, <clears throat> moving the student to a more restrictive environment, MRE, so to speak, over parent's objection is difficult. You should think long and hard before you do that. And you really have to prove three things. You have to prove that the current situation is not working. So by the way, in order to prove that the situation's not working, we have to notice that the situation's not working. So we have to monitor student progress, and if the student's not doing well, we should be the first to call attention to it. Now the parent shouldn't hear about the problems for the first time at a case conference committee. They should be informed as we're going along. You know, Mr. Walsh, your child's not making a lot of progress. We're a little concerned about how things are going. Let's talk about it. So we've got to show that the current situation's not working. Secondly, we have to show that we've really tried. You know, I asked a principal one time, have you tried inclusion? He said, yes, last Thursday, we tried inclusion. Didn't work. Well, that ain't gonna cut it. So have we really tried? Have we given it a good faith effort? Have we involved supplementary aids and services? Have we brainstormed about how we can serve the student better? And then you have to be prepared to show that the more restrictive environment uh, is not just for the sake of the other students in the class, it's gonna benefit this student. So we have to be prepared to show that. So uh, there's some cases that illustrate this. Uh, look at uh, Wishard versus Waynesboro over on page 32. The court upheld the ruling of the hearing officer in favor of a change of placement to a more restrictive setting. The court held the district based this on years of data showing that the student had struggled in the mainstream the district provided an array of supplementary aids and services. Students' presence in the general classroom led to greater distraction for him and others, uh, and so on. So there you go. Next case, similar, EB versus Baldwin Park. A court affirmed the hearing officer's ruling again in favor of a move to a more restrictive environment. The student was making very little progress, engaged in inappropriate behaviors, unable to do the level of work the other students did, consuming too much of the teacher's time. All that's a judgment call, obviously. But those are the standards that the school has to be prepared to show if, if, that's, their, if that's their case. So let's talk about parents' uh, rights and responsibilities. And th here's where we do have a lot of cases in this section where hearing officers have found fault with the behavior of the parents. Uh, so uh, this first case, Lake Washington, this is a case where the school district felt uh, concern about the manner in which the parent was communicating with the school. And so they put some restrictions on it. Can you do that? Yes. But be prepared for uh, being accused of retaliation. If you restrict how a parent communicates with the school, please run it by your school attorney, because we want to be sure that we're not restricting things that we shouldn't restrict. But if the parent has, you know, if you have uh, evidence of, you know, bad treatment by the parent towards school staff, uh, some restrictions can be applied. But just, no, the parent, you know, I've been involved in some of these and I've helped the school district write the letter and I always tell them, this parent is gonna say you're singling me out. Well, we are. <laughs> we think we're singling you out for a reason. Uh, but we are singling you out. You're gonna get a retaliation complaint. It's gonna happen. Uh, so you just need to be prepared for that. So that, that's an illustration of how that works. Um, Coleman versus Wake County. Uh, court found that the parents were responsible for the increase in inappropriate behaviors. Uh, the parents intentionally withheld the student from attendance until after noon each day, so he'd miss his core classes. I don't know what that's about, but that didn't come across as, uh, and then you look at the comment. The court said the IEP meetings were lengthy. They tended to be contentious and emotional. <clears throat> you know, that right there doesn't mean anybody's behaving badly. There's emotional issues we talk about at case conference committees. Sometimes it is tense, sometimes it is emotional. That's, that's not a violation of anybody's rights. Uh, but the court said the plaintiff talked very loudly, interrupted others, argued over minuscule things for hours. Uh, it's the school district's meeting. The school district should have some ground rules and should control the process. Meaningful parent participation means the school doesn't control the outcome but it controls the process. It should, because it's the school's meeting, okay? Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Over at the bottom of page 35, EC versus USD 385 Andover from Kansas. Parents were stopped. That's a great legal word. Toss that into your nephew who's in law school. 
Uh, the parents were stopped, that means you, you can't do this, from con complaining about the lack of an autism label because they repeatedly refused to consent to an evaluation requested by the school. You know, if I had to pinpoint one parent behavior that hearing officers and courts pick up on and, and consider unreasonable, it's the parent's refusal to request, uh, to consent when the school district offers to do an evaluation. It, it, what is that about? The school district is offering to gather more information about your child at no cost to you to help them serve your child better, and you won't give consent. What's that about? It comes across as unreasonable, okay? Top of page uh, 36. Banwert versus Cedar Falls, a parent's request for reimbursement for a unilateral placement at a residential school rejected. Court repeatedly pointed out the parents made this decision without asking the school to amend the current IEP. Parents, if you're unhappy with the school's program, take it to the school. Ask for a case conference committee. Do that first. Give the school an opportunity to fix the problem. Be specific. This is what I'm not happy about. This is what I'd like to see. Give the school an opportunity. If you do end up in litigation with the school, that's gonna serve you well, the fact that you did that, okay? Uh, let's see, what else? Thomas versus Empire Springs Charter Schools. Do you have charter schools in Indiana? You do, all right. Charter schools are subject to special education law. And this is kind of a real interesting one. This, uh, this student was in special ed. Now this is a charter school that required students to take the statewide testing unless you were in special ed. And the student was in special ed. So the student did not have to take the statewide testing. Well, look at the top of page 38. Let's look at the timeline. April 1st, the parent revoked consent for special ed completely. I don't know what motivated that, but parents have that right. The parent gave written notice to the school, I want my kid out of special ed right now. Okay, April 3rd, school acknowledges it. It said, oh, by the way, now that your student is a general ed student, your student will be responsible for taking the statewide test, which was just about to come up. It's April. April 5th, parent says, oh, wait, I want special ed services. And the parent thought that by making that request, this is her testimony, I thought I could just put them back in. And the court said, no, you can't just put them back in. You have to start over if you've revoked consent. And so the school district said, well, you know, okay, you want special ed, we will do an initial evaluation. But that's gonna take some time. And meanwhile, the testing is coming up. Your child is a general ed student. Your child needs to take the test. Child didn't take the test, and the school disenrolled him. Pub traditional public school couldn't do that. Charter school can do that. And the charter school did do that. And they got sued over it, and the court said, you had a rule that applies to special ed and, you know, it applies to all students, it's a neutral rule, you did the right thing, or you did a legal thing, anyway. You know, I read this case and I thought, I wonder, I wonder if the school was happy to see this parent go. Because I, when I read it, I kind of think, you know, you know I th legally I think the school's correct, but it's not like they didn't have evaluation data to establish that the student qualified for special ed. The only reason the student was pulled out of special ed is parent request. Two days later, the parent changes her mind. Now, I think if this is a kid they really wanted to keep, a parent they really wanted to keep, they would have put him back in special ed. I think that would have been equally legally defensible. So it's kind of interesting. So let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, personnel. Uh, sometimes complaints come from personnel, retaliation cases, Powers versus Northside. These are a couple, this is a fight in the school district over uh, accommodations in statewide testing for students under Section 504. And the principal and assistant principal who filed this lawsuit were reprimanded by the school for their failure uh, to uh, do the right thing by way of accommodations. So they called the agency to ask about this. And then they ended up getting uh, terminated from their employment. Now, they didn't get terminated for calling the agency. They got terminated for their failure to uh, serve students in 504 properly. But they said, we think it's because we complained to the state agency. And the court said, when you are speaking as an employee, that's not protected speech. When you are speaking as a citizen on matters of public concern, that is protected speech. So, uh, so, so they, you know, they were unsuccessful in their litigation. You know, and this stuff comes up all the time. We had an internal dialogue in our firm just the other day. A teacher in one of the school districts that we represent 
had sent out an email to all parents that, that she uh, was working with. Teacher sends an email to parents informing, asking the parents to make sure that their students will violate the school's rules about mask mandate. This is a school that has ordered masking for all students. And the teacher has sent an email to the parents saying, please tell your kids not to wear the masks. Is that protected free speech? We had an internal debate in the, in the law firm about that, and the consensus was unanimous. That is not protected free speech. That is undercutting uh, what the school district is, the school district's rules and policies, and, that, and that's not okay. Uh, Heron versus Trenton. Uh, oh, this is a classic. This is great. Look at the court refused to, this is another retaliation case, and the court is not going to quickly uh, uh, dismiss it, and it's because of the timeline. Now, this aide called the child abuse hotline. The aide called the child abuse hotline, not complaining about a parent, complaining about the school. And her complaint was that the district was not adequately staffed to fulfill its IEP obligations. The aide's contract was non-renewed just two days after that. You know, in Texas, paraprofessionals don't have contracts, but apparently in Tennessee they do. So two days after she calls the child abuse hotline, <laughs> she's out, all right? Uh, and, and, and the court said, well, she was, I mean, the school district's response to that was, well, she wasn't a very good employee anyway. That's why we did it. Well, let's take a look at her evaluations. Guess what they show? Exceeds expectations meets all standards. In fact, look at the comment here. Nine days prior to the non-renewal, and therefore seven days prior to the call to the child abuse hotline, the assistant principal completed the aide's evaluation, said she meets or exceeds the standards and expectations in all categories. She does a great job. The aide had three years of prior evaluations. They all said the same thing. Great employee. Calls the child abuse hotline. Non-renewed. That sure looks like a retaliation case, okay? So I heard Julie say this yesterday, if you have an employee with performance problems, you have to document them. Otherwise, you know, maybe she was a lousy aide. Well, then they were, you know, why are they giving her such positive evaluations? So we want to be careful about that. Uh, Kirilenko, I, I, I call this case to your attention not because of personnel issues, but because of transition plans. Let's think just a second about transition plans for students as they get ready to exit high school. I'm no expert on that, but just common sense tells me that every student's transition plan should include at least one goal to develop self-advocacy skills. Because once the student leaves the cocoon of K through 12 schooling, they're gonna need that. This is a good example of this. This is a nurse working for a school district, and she filed a suit over disability discrimination. But she was asked to provide documentation. Oh, you say you, you know, sometimes it's obvious that a person has a disability. This one wasn't. And the school district said, oh, you want us to accommodate it? You'll need to bring us some documentation to establish that you have a disability that requires accommodation. She didn't do it. And that, you know, it's, it, it, there's no child fine once you leave K through 12 schooling. So that student who goes on to a community college or into the military, or to a four-year college, or to a work situation, wherever they go, they are going to need self-advocacy skills because they're on their own from that time forward. They need to know where the disability discrimination office is. They need to know how to knock on the door. They need to know how to generate their own documentation. They need to know how to request specifically what they need. So this goes back to the transition plan. Let's make sure that every transition plan is addressing self-advocacy. Okay, so personnel issues, what we got here. Uh, free speech, age-old problems like that case I told you about, transition plans, there we go. Okay, practice and procedure. This is another section of the handout that's for the lawyers. Uh, this is all the statute of limitation cases and stuff like that, so I don't wanna call a lot of attention to it except for uh, the Northwest case, which is over on page 43 of your materials. Uh, this one, I think, is, this one illustrates what I call the need for mild cross-examination. Do you all know how to do mild cross-examination? I think you do. How many of you are married? <laughs> or you have children? Uh, you know how to do mild, mild cross Mild cross-examination, you, you don't have to go to law school. Uh, it's a natural gift for a lot of people. 
It is not Tom Cruise to Jack Nicholson. It is not the dramatic encounter that you see on TV. Mild cross-examination is just being persistent about asking the questions that need to be asked. You guys deal with a lot of outside experts telling the school what they ought to do. And we need to have mild cross-examination to deal with that. This Northwest case is a good example of it. The art committee got conflicting recommendations from experts about how to serve a student with dyslexia. That's not unusual. Reputable, well-qualified experts will frequently disagree. Parent brings the school an outside report from someone. I recommend you do uh, three things. Number one, say thank you. Say thank you. Parents are bringing us some more evaluation data that will help us serve the student better. Thank you. That's the first thing to do. Second thing, ask the parent for consent to talk to the person who just provided that report. Oh, I see this report is from Dr. Smith, who's an expert on dyslexia. We would like to talk to Dr. Smith to flesh this out a little bit. And we can't do that without your consent. Would you please sign consent so that we can do that? If the parent refuses to give that consent, let's document the fact that we've asked for it and we didn't get it. If the parent does give consent, then we go to step three. Step one, thank you. Step two, here's our consent form. We'd like to talk to this person. Step three, mild cross-examination. And when you read some of these cases, you can see that somebody, somebody did that. Now, if you go to court, I guarantee you, your lawyer's going to do it. What does mild cross-examination exist of? Did you do any formal testing with the student? How frequently did you meet with the student? Where did you meet the student? Who else was there? Have you ever observed the student in the school setting? Have you talked to the teachers who have been working with the student for the past year? These are questions that professional people should not be embarrassed to answer. This is not rude. This is not hostile. This is mild cross-examination. But what it's aimed to get at is, what's the foundation for your opinion? Because here's what happens sometimes. Have you looked at the student's IEP? No, I haven't. Have you talked to the teachers who've worked with? No, I didn't talk to the teachers. Have you ever observed the student in the school setting? No, I haven't. Where did you meet with the student? In my office. How long? 30 minutes. Who else was there? His mother. That's it? Yes. Unspoken is, so therefore you really don't know what you're talking about, do you? But you don't have to say that. You just have to ask the questions and document the responses. That's called mild cross-examination. And this is why so frequently in these cases you'll see there is a qualified outside expert giving testimony in the case, but the court goes with the teachers because they're in the classroom, they know what's going on, and their testimony is far more credible, typically. Okay? So, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's my guidelines on that. Let's see. How are we doing on time? We're getting... Getting close to finishing time, I think, here. Now i got to bounce back and forth. Where did I put the clicker? Now we have all manner of problems. Uh, ah, here it is. Okay. So, mild cross-examination. So, unilateral placement. Uh, parents have to give advance notice. They face consequences if they fail to do so. There's some cases in here about uni unilateral placement that make that clear. Oh, I did want to call your attention to a stay-put case. I forgot that. Bottom of page 49. There's a case from Comal Independent School District, which is not too far from where I live. <clears throat> so this is a case where the school district is trying to change the student's placement to a more restrictive environment. Uh, they had an ARD meeting, you call that a case conference committee, just prior to this past school year, the 2021 school year. And the school district proposed a change of placement, moving the student from the general classroom to a special ed setting. So we're, we're proposing a move to a more restrictive environment and the parent disagrees, okay? So the parent requested a hearing. What happens? What happens when the parent opposes a change of placement by requesting a hearing? Stay put. So the student's not going anywhere, right? So the school year starts and the student is still in the general classroom, which is not what the school had recommended, but the student's in a stay put situation. The hearing officer's decision happens, uh, comes out on March 19th. So we're through, you know, we're like at spring break. We're like through two-thirds of the way through the school year, and the student has been in a stay-put situation the entire time. The hearing officer rules in favor of the school. The hearing officer said, I think the change of placement is appropriate, and therefore the school is authorized to make the change of placement. Stay-put's over, right? No. The parent's lawyer immediately put the school on notice that we intend to appeal this into court. And this court said, well, that keeps stay put in place. 
Now, I don't know how long this case is going to go on. It could go to the district court. It could go to the Fifth Circuit. It could go to the Supreme Court. We could be talking about it at this conference five years from now, and the stay put rule might still be in place. What are the implications of that? You guys need to work real hard to get parental agreement to a change of placement that they don't agree to. Because if we end up in a stay put situation, it could be for a long time. Now, I don't think that could lead to ridiculous results. The student's getting older, and the parties can always agree to changes that they agree to. So as the student moves from grade to grade, surely the parties are working out agreements. But just to point out that stay put can go on for a long time. Um, unilateral placement, there's quite a few cases where, you know, what I perceive is the parent has chosen a really good private school, a school that has a lot of one-to-one -one attention, school that has a lot of uh, qualified staff and so on. But, um, you know, it doesn't always come out well. If you look at, I want you to look at the uh, Fragnito case over on page 51. Um, parent places the child in a, what I assume is a good private school, but they fail to offer evidence of its appropriateness to meet the unique needs of the student. Most importantly, the parent did not know whether the private school provided any special ed services. Well, that's why you put the child there, right? <clears throat> well, no, they put them there because it's a really good school. Well, really good school doesn't mean appropriate for special ed, okay? <clears throat> so the school was small. It emphasized its ability to meet individual needs. <clears throat> and the court said, well, they do that for everybody at that school. That's not really <clears throat> specially designed instruction. So got to be careful about that. But the school district's best defense to claims of uh, unilateral placement is, is the same as it's always been, which is uh, do the right thing and have what we call RWA to FAPE the kid. Be sure you are ready, willing, and able, RWA, to provide a free appropriate public education to the student and that that's well documented. And, you know, then, then if the parent chooses to put the child in a private school at their own expense, it's probably going to be at their own expense <clears throat> uh, because the parent has to prove that the school has not offered a free appropriate public education. Okay, so there's my contact information. I got a couple other things on here. We might have a time for a Q or two and an A or two. So let's look at page 53 on my truly miscellaneous but interesting section of the handout. <clears throat> uh, this first one is just sad from the District of Columbia. Just look at the comment from the court. The court says a historical recitation of this case shows that the DC schools, the administrative law system, the courts all failed DB, the student. A young man who was denied a FAPE over five years ago is no longer young. He's 20 years old. He operates at a below kindergarten level. What little progress he once made is long gone. It's evaporated while his case bounced back and forth between administrative hearings and this court as the case stalled, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just, you know, our system's kind of broken. I, th I think it is broken in some places more than others. I've read cases from New Jersey where they're like two years behind in conducting due process hearings. What is that about? Uh, that's not going on in Texas. We don't have that problem. I don't think you do either. But there's a lot of problems with the system. Um, Mackey versus Bremerton. You know, I've, I've occasionally gotten questions along this line. Are we going to have liability to the teacher who gets injured by a student with a disability, physically injured? And, you know, that's going to depend a lot on your state law and so on, but this is a case where the teacher sued the principal, the district, the director of special programs. She alleges that she was locked in a classroom for hours, locked in, with a student known to be violent. Uh, partial motions for summary judgment were filed by both sides where they were denied. The court said there's too many fact issues here to sort out, so it's probably going to end up in a trial. And then here's that EMDH case again. I, showed, I talked to you about this one. This is the one where somebody at the school said, your daughter's just too smart to be in special ed. And uh, look at the attorney's fees that have been racked up here. Uh, the parents won this case, and therefore they're entitled to recover attorney's fees. But now we're wrangling over how much. And the latest request, the parents are asking for $838,689.16. And uh, that, that's for uh, reimbursement, I guess, for expenses, but then an additional $75,000 in attorney's fees. So the total is over $914,000. We're getting close to a million dollars. The court said, uh, I think I have a quote here. The court said, this is counter to the cooperative process required by IDEA. It's excessive. It may not be supportable. 
The court blasted both sides. The court blasted the school for its failure to serve the student appropriately, and it basically threw up its hands and said, uh, you know, these numbers are not okay, and you guys need to work this out, and if you don't, I'm going to bring in a Rule 706 expert. Well, I don't know what the hell a 706 expert is, but it sounds kind of ominous, so I think they need to resolve that. So, Okay, I think we, we have about five minutes maybe, so anybody have anyone to lob any questions my way? If you do, we're willing to take that. I didn't, uh, I didn't give you my test to see if you guys are special ed types. How many consider yourself special ed types? Raise your hands. Mitch, you are? Yeah. Raise your hand. You should be proud. It's a good thing to be a special ed type. I think there's more special ed types than that in the room. I'm going to administer the quiz right now. We'll see how you do. Quiz is based upon a uh, question I got from a special ed director a few years ago, she said, we've got this student that uh, is not doing well, and we're thinking about all our special programs, but he doesn't seem to qualify for anything. We've looked at all the rules and regulations, and we can't quite figure out what to do. Do you have any suggestions? I said, well, it sounds to me like you, th you thought the kid might be uh, LD, OHI, due to ADD, ADHD, maybe ED. I'm sure you wanted to come up with an IEP, <clears throat> provide FAPE and the LRE. I'm sure you looked at uh, IEPs, OTs, ATs, and ATDs. I'm sure you looked at the TEA and the OCR guidance. Finally, you ARD'd the kid, you 504'd him, you PRC'd him, and you DNQ'd him. I'd say the KID is O-U-T. <laughs> How many of you got 80% of that? You are a special ed type, all right? Congratulations. So, well, thanks again for having me at this conference. I hope this has been beneficial. I'll be speaking again at, uh, after lunch. Thank you.